Welcome, friend, to the second day of our two-day event here in Sweden. I'm very happy to see all of you again. It's a great pleasure to see such wonderful souls seeking to go back to their true home, having had enough of this experience in physical, astral, and causal worlds. <coughs> I mentioned to you yesterday Today, I will tell you how to go beyond the mind. Actually, that's not a very accurate statement. You cannot go beyond the mind, period. But you can be pulled to, the, to a situation, to a place, to a being, a state of being which is beyond the mind. When we look at the faculties we have, and the experiences we have in this world, we find we try to struggle and make an effort for everything. There's nothing we feel can come by itself, except one thing. You fall in love with somebody, or somebody fall in love with you, you have made no effort. Love has never taken any effort. If you try to make an effort, if you feel love, effort, love, love goes away. If you think too much about love, love goes away. But love is something that pulls you without effort. That's the very way we go beyond the mind. Something beyond the mind must pull us so that we can go beyond. Effort will not do anything. Love will. Love is very powerful. It's the most powerful factor. Sometimes people say, God is love. Our true reality is love, which is true. If you were to examine consciousness in its pure state, it's nothing but love. And that is why it's a very appropriate saying, God is love. Where is God? Within us. Where? Beyond our mind. God can pull us. But we don't meet God as God at all. For all intents and purposes, we see the creation of God. We see the manifestation of God in all of us, in everything, in trees, even in the microphone, even in the glass of water. If God or consciousness totality of consciousness were not there, we wouldn't be conscious of anything, nor aware of anything. This whole creation would disappear. So that is why we do not see God, we see the manifestation of God. God can manifest in many ways, in ways so that we can fulfill our spirit of adventure for which we came into these different levels of consciousness. We did not come here to settle down. No way. The spirit and soul has never sought to settle down anywhere else except its true home. But spirit, like mind, also likes adventure. Even love likes adventure. And therefore, love has percolated through all these regions and has come to us here and has experienced even here. We experience all kinds of love. We have different expressions of love. And we divide them into compartments. We cannot equate a sexual love for somebody, attraction for somebody, with a mother's love for a child. These we have compartmentalized the expressions of love and reduced it to something that is not true love. Of course, true love is behind all this. But we have used our mind to divide it, put it into ethical, ethical channels and separated them. And that is why we are very confused. How can we use love, which has been so compartmentalized, which was completely whole? It has to pull from where it is whole. Where does love manifest in its entirety? in this created world. 
only in a human being whose awareness is totally at the level of totality of consciousness, total love. That is why when we are ready to go beyond the mind, we are pulled by love of God, of the Creator, as manifested in somebody who is like us but has an awareness of totality. If somebody were to ask me, why do we need a master? Why are you talking of PLMs and perfect living masters? If God is within us and we are seeking God, we don't need any outside intervention. We don't need an agent to take us to God. Why can't we go to God directly? We have feelings inside. We want to go to God. There's a simple reason why we did that. When we seek God, we separate God from ourselves, And God cannot be separated from us. We are totally at all times a part of God. When we as individuals with mind, senses and body want to think of God, we separate the self from God, which is an untrue statement. And that is why if we have separated God, we separate ourselves from everybody else. We separate from each human being. We separate from nature. We separate ourselves even from our own self. This separation is being accomplished by a very small mechanical unit called the th mind, thinking mind. It has caused the separation. That is why so long as we feel we are separate from God, we cannot see, be, or with God. We are separate. And the tr truth is we are not separate. So that is why if there is any one justification for a perfect living master to come into our life, it is this, that he represents at the same time, as a human being, he represents the love of God, pure love from totality. If he is not in a state of awareness where he is Constantly, even in the wakeful state of the human being, aware of totality, he cannot help us. That is why so many masters have come. There are so many sadhus, fakirs, swamis, masters in the world today. I believe there are more masters than disciples. It's become a big business. Big business. A perfect living master really does things a little differently from these masters. First of all, he never says, I am a master. Not necessary. He says, I am a servant of the master and servant of everybody I serve. Secondly, he will never, never charge for his service to give you love and take you back. It's impossible to make love a business. He cannot make it a business. And a perfect living master will never charge for his services. There have been a lot of perfect living masters. One of them was Kabir. Some people in the West have heard his name also. Kabir was a weaver, weaving cloth. His disciples were millionaires. And they offered to him to come live in our beautiful mansions, our homes. He said, no. I have to live by destiny and make my living by weaving cloth. Rami Das, another master, perfect living master, was a cobbler. Used to make and mend shoes. His, his hut, where he did this job, was outside the palace of the king. King's name, first name was Pipa. King Pipa had a palace right next to the little hut where this cobbler Rami Das used to work. The king offered him to come. He'll give him a wonderful suite and a place to work in the palace. He said, no, my destiny is to work here. I live my destiny fully. Like you are living as a king, I am living as a cobbler. These are signs of perfect living master. i tell you a story about Ravi Das. You might have heard before. One day, Rather, once upon a time, okay. 
one day King Pipa realized that I have a per perfect living master sitting next to me and I am not taking full advantage of it. So deciding that I must get something, real grace from the master. So early morning, three o'clock, he woke up and without telling anybody, he quietly slipped out of the palace and went to Ravidas. At that time, in the early morning, Ravidas was still working on repairing some shoes. Ravidas said, Majesty, what brings you here at so early in the morning? He said, I have not come as a king, I have come as a beggar. I want your grace. He said, really you want grace? Come only for grace at this time? He was, he had some leather piece put in a cup of water. He took the leather piece out and said, here, here is holy water, drink it. King saw dirty water taken out from the leather. So he did in front of him, put up his hand like this and he poured the water. King never drank it, allowed it to go down his sleeve and ran, ran back. He said, I could never imagine instead of giving me grace, instead of blessing me, he gave me dirty water to drink. And he took off his robes and he saw his shirt sleeve was all stained with the leather water. Took off his shirt, called his confidential attendants. Please take this shirt to the washerman who is also living on the compound of the palace. Please make sure it is clean right now and brought to me nice and clean in the morning. The attendants took the shirt to the washerman who was sleeping. He woke him up and a young daughter of his also woke up. What has happened? Anything wrong with the king? No king has said a shirt for washing, but he wants it urgently. It will be washed right now. He needs it before the morning. Okay, we'll do it. They both got up, the daughter and the father, and they began to wash. They found the stain was too much. So the father told the little daughter, why don't you take the stain off by rubbing something? So daughter, instead of rubbing something, began to chew on the stain to take it off. As she began to chew on the stain, she began to talk of higher awareness and higher levels of consciousness. Father was surprised what has happened. In the morning, she was giving discourses. A lot of people came to hear little girl talking of some higher levels. Many people came. And the king also heard. He said, it's amazing that my washerman's daughter should have got enlightened and I didn't get anything. So he went to the daughter. Daughter got up. And the king said, I have not come as a king. Again, I have come as a beggar. Tell me, how did you get this enlightenment? She said, I have not got up to salute you as a king. I have got up because all I got was from you. It was in your shirt. He was surprised. He said, OK. I went back to the master, Ravidas. Please give me some more of that water. He said, the water is dirty. It's full of leather and all. How can I give you dirty water? He said, no, that water contains something. Is there nothing in this water? You can drink the whole of it, nothing will happen. These are some rare moments when our seeking becomes so intense that these masters, who are working from a totally different level of awareness, and they give grace at once. And he got that grace. The king said, now please move into my palace. He said, no, I have to complete my destiny here. Why am I telling you this story? Because these masters, they, if they start charging for their business, it's, it's a regular business transaction. They don't come to take, they come to give. How can they take? to take their work they are living. Great master, worked to the government of India, worked to the services of the, of the public works department as a road engineer. He qualified from an engineering college in Roorkee. 
and then he worked there, retired from there. And from his meager pension, he was able to go and buy what he needed. Even after he became a master, which was still while he was serving in the government, never charged anything. After retirement, he went to a farm and, grow, and began to grow sugarcane crop and began to make some additional income so he could help his family better. It's a great example they set for us. They never charge anything. Not only they never claim to be masters, they function like exactly ordinary people. Sometimes more ordinary than ordinary people. So it is very different from the masters who say, come, I am a master, I can help you. Give me so much money and I'll pray for you. I don't know the situation in Sweden, but I know in the United States, the number of masters, evangelists, who come on television. You can go to heaven, $25 check. <laughs> Simple. They'll pray for us. It's, it, they made it a business. They have several gurus who are charging for their services. So that is why it's a different ball game. These masters have worked according to their destiny and earned their living by working and not use any of the donations that the people give. They can accept donations for helping people, not for themselves, not for personal use. Anything they donated is used for helping to organize their discourses. In Red Master's time, people brought a lot of money. Not too many people were there. The total, when I and my father went first time to Great Master, the monthly or weekly satsang discourses used to consist of an audience of 20, 25 people. There used to be a big bandara, annual bandara, on the day his master passed away, which was 29th of December each year. That day, big crowd came, 200 people. That was a big crowd. Later on, of course, in the last bandara that he had, there were 400,000 people. It grew slowly, but it grew in about 40 years, it grew to that level. These, till the last moment, this master did not accept any money, but there were no banks to keep the donation money. So he wore a long coat, you don't see it in this picture, and which has a big pocket outside, and he wore a vest in which his pension used to come when he had retired, and he put the pension in the inner pocket, and he kept the donation outer pocket. For his personal use, he used the inner pocket. For work related to the DERA, to the institution, for people to hold meetings, to arrange for meetings, you the outer pocket. I was introduced to him at a very early age. And that is why I became a very big skeptic later on. And I'll explain. I was a baby when I was introduced. First time my father took me there, I was 29 days old. As I grew up, Master was part of the family, and he would sometimes, as I grew up, carry me in his arms and walk to the candy store and buy a little sweet for me. It used to be called barfi. Little sweet, made of milk, and he would take the money to buy me the sweet from the inner rest, inner pocket, and not from the outer pocket. I still remember. So I can never forget how he used to leave the court and to go into his vest pocket to buy the little candy for me. I've, till, till today, I can't forget it. Very, very high impact these things had. But of course, instead of appreciating all that, as I grew up, I became more and more skeptical. I said, I know them. This guy loves me very much. But I am following him 
not because I know him. I am following him because he is my dad's master. I happen to be born in that family and accidentally I am accepting him. Maybe they are great masters, greater masters outside. Never got a chance to see them. How can I be sure that this is the master who can help me? I was very curious, of course, but my curiosity was also leading to skepticism and doubt. How can I accept him when the only reason I've seen him is my dad followed him? I have, it's an accident of birth. And when he initiated me very early, on the 9th of March, 1936, I was only nine and a half years old. Today I realize why he initiated me early. Because he wanted me to test out what he is giving and what others are giving. So at the time of initiation, he told me to sit in front. In fact, he carried me. Up. My grandfather, who also became his initiate, actually took me to get initiated. He used to give young children half initiation, which means they were told how to listen to sounds inside. Children listen much faster because distractions are much less. When they grew up and became teenagers, they'd come back, he'd give them the second half, a repetition of words, listening to sound with words, doing dhyan, doing contemplation of master, all those things were taught in the second half. My grandfather took me for first half initiation. When he brought me in front, he knew me. He'd seen me growing from a childhood. So he asked me, oh, see, happy to see you. What, what do you want? I said, I want initiation. He said, do you want it sweet or salted? Because he used to have some candy with him. Most children would say sweet, he would give them a candy, they'd run away. I knew that, I'd seen that. He did this for children. So I said, no, I don't want salt and sweet. I want this one inside. He laughed. He laughed, hugged me, took, took him in his arm and just held them. He was selecting people for initiation and he began to continue selecting. Never said yes or no to my request. So, but he wouldn't let me go. I said, if he says no, I'll run away. If he says yes, I'll wait with the others who have been told to go, go into the room. He neither said yes nor no, but did not leave his clasp on my side like this. When the selection was over, he said, come with me. He kept holding me. Come with me. Sit right in front. I sat in front. He said, you will get full initiation which is an exception to the rule. When I sat there, I remembered till today it looks like it happened this morning. That event is so clear before initiating me. And he told me and everybody, what I am going to give you, I get got from my master Baba Jamal Singh. It has worked for me. I hope it will work for you. If it does not, you are completely free to go and search for something else. And if you find something better, take it. Don't come back to me for permission. Permission granted in advance. Take it. Just do me one favor. If you find something better, please come back and tell me so I can also go and take it. The great master's words. I was struck by the openness because some people were talking of this whole teaching to be a cult. This statement is exactly the opposite of what happens in a cult. A cult binds you down. People who are in a cult have a difficulty to get out of it. They are afraid. They work in fear. Here he is telling me, go ahead and find something better. Not only I took his words very seriously, and I can remember this till now. I have spent my life in searching for something better. I am not going against his wishes. 
I have met so many masters. I don't know any, any friend of mine, anybody in the world who has met so many masters. Every master I heard of, I meant. I converted to different religions. All I could lay my hands on. Tried all kinds of yoga. All kinds of, met all kinds of swamis. Had strange diets sometimes, eating sand or something in some cases. <laughs> Tried such strange things. But at the end I found, not only are they not able to take you anywhere higher, but they don't, don't even able, they are not even able to describe what is higher. And none of them were even able to talk about the differentiation between the mind and the soul and how the mind becomes a block in our, in our growth, spiritual growth. Many of them were totally confused about the universal soul, universal truth, universal consciousness, and universal mind. Most of them were so confused about it themselves. And when I heard their talks, in many of their talks, especially very learned people, their talks contained so many Words like perhaps, maybe, could be. He never used these words. He spoke directly the truth. So I examined this very carefully. And examined for several years, not one day or two days. Several years. When I could not find anything better. After about eight, nine years, I was in college. I went back to him. And I said... I couldn't find anything better. I want to try your method seriously now. He said, very good. And he says, he was so full of love. He talked in a way that you could feel love flowing from him. Giving me a big hug. He said, you are ready to go move forward. Then I realized that the real secret is to reach the top of the causal region where the universal mind exists and from there get pulled up to my true home. So I worked very hard to reach the top of the causal region. I thought maybe more meditation will help me. He said approximately two and a half hours, one tenth of your time, give to this. But he also said Remember, the truth is within all the time. Remember that this is all external. We have to live our lives because we've come for that. Remember, we have created our destinies and we have come to have an experience different from the experience of our own true home. And that is why I tried hard. The more I meditated, the more frustrated I got. Because nothing would happen. I said, there's something missing. Maybe I'm not meditating enough. And for some time, I said, let me put my whole effort in meditation, up to eight hours a session. I could see few things. I could withdraw. I could feel my body is numb. I could feel many things, but not satisfactory at all. I'm not satisfied. So I went back to him. And I said, I've tried very, very strongly, with maximum effort, what you have told. It doesn't give the results that you talk about. I just get frustrated at different points, I get stuck. I don't know what to do. He said, you should come to me every time you get stuck. So that I can explain to you how to go over the obstacle that comes on the way. He says, in the case of certain disciples who have to make higher progress, there are more obstacles that will come in the way. Those who are just satisfied with doing the best they can, there are less obstacles. And they can wait for next life, third life, fourth life. But for those who are very serious about going back in the same life, there are more obstacles placed by the negative entity in us called the mind. Why, is it, why does the mind create this obstacle? Because the design of this creation has divided 
this experience of our world into two parts, positive and negative. Like the duality I spoke of yesterday, even the whole universe is functioning under a positive energy, negative energy. And when you examine them, the soul represents in us the positive energy. Love, knowledge, true knowledge, intuitive knowledge, beauty, expression of beauty, appreciation, belong to the positive category. Thinking, in order to scatter your attention. Use of mind, to, to have more joy and pleasure from this world. Creates obstacles and distractions. There are some major obstacles that come in our way. And they are designed by the mind. So that it is like the survival of this universe. So if it was easy, if we souls could just go easily with no obstacle, maybe we would, many of us sitting here would have been there already. It's the mind that is stopping us. How does the mind stop? By creating certain conditions in which these things work. Number one distraction happens to be lust. This is a very big factor in keeping us thinking about the created world. We all have it. It's built into us. And therefore, it's very difficult. Some people say, these lustful thoughts we have and these sexual thoughts we have, they drive us crazy. And meditation is so difficult. They try to practice celibacy. Celibacy does not take away the lustful thing built into the system. It only makes you work harder and makes you in more interested in getting into that what you're trying to avoid. It's a very strange thing. The mind functions like that. If you say, don't do it, mind will want to do it even more. If you don't know this, try it on a child. When you stop him from something, he like to do that more. We are all children that way. And we are unable to control. Very serious talk. Okay, I'll stop for a second. Tell you a joke about celibacy. The monks on, on, in Tibet and the border of Tibet observe celibacy in their monasteries. I've been to those monasteries. As it happened, I was given a job that stretched the area of my work right to the border of Tibet. And so we had many monasteries there. And I went to one of them. And there people observed celibacy. But one American tourist once came. And he went and saw the monastery. Not only were they reciting the Buddhist prayer, Om Mane Padme Ho. Not only were they reciting that, they recite in a very beautiful way. They recite by the first person saying, Om. Others are quiet. When he says Mane, and the next one says Om. So all others are quiet. Say, first one is Om Mane Padme. They, so what happens when they go like this, not all of them are repeating the same thing. All are the different words of the mantra that they have. It's a beautiful sound that comes up by combination of recital by different people. I enjoyed that. But about the American tourist, when he came, he found that most of the time they are not doing prayer. They are writing in, in large, big files, white paper files, Parchments taken from the old records of the time of Buddha. At the time of Buddha, what he spoke, he never wrote anything. But people who heard him, they scribbled notes. There was no paper at that time. They used to take the bark of a tree and write on that. And they used to put them in little earthenware and buckets and store it there. They were called 
jatakas, those today called jatakas, placed in those earthen ways. So they had a lot of them, and they would take them out and scribble from there. Then they would preserve them, and from what they've written, they would copy again and again to make more copies. No printers were there. So this American tourist found all of them writing from earlier copies. And he said to the abbot of that monastery, if somebody makes a mistake in one of these, and from there you copy, the mistake will continue forever. That's a dangerous thing. The abbot said, no, once, once in a while we do check up. We have the originals, but we keep them safely in the basement of this monastery. So the, he said, I'll go and check a particular page, whether the mistake has been made or not. So he went to the basement. He began to shout something in Tibetan language or something, Bodhi language. And everybody was surprised. So the head monk followed. He also began to shout. The American tourists couldn't understand why are they shouting. So he also went down the steps into the basement. And there the abbot was screaming, we made a mistake. We made a big mistake. The word was celebrate. And we cut out the R, it's become celibate. It's just a joke, it's not true. All right, true story. That celebration and made it to celibacy, celibacy. Lust after lust, very close to lust, is a second distraction. And that distraction really disturbs our meditation. And that is anger. We get angry so soon, little things provoke us. I don't know. Have you, have you ever made a decision? I will never do this again. How many of you ever had decided, I will never do this again, and still did it? It's very common. It's amazing. Okay, I'll tell you another story. Once upon a time, okay, that's how story begins. Once upon a time, there were two elk hunters. They would go to the mountains to hunt for elks. And they hired a small plane. And they flew on a little patch that they had at the top of the mountain where the elks lived. And they would uh, land on that little landing space. And then they went and hunted and killed four elks and dragged them to the plane. The pilot said, you know, this plane is too small. These elks are heavy. If you load all four, the plane will crash. I can take two at a time, make two flights. They said, no, last year we had four. We took in the plane all four. How can you say that? So force, forcibly, they loaded all the four elks into the plane. He took off, the plane crashed. And pilot died, plane was in debris. Somehow, these two hunters survived. And out of debris they come out, and one asks the other, where are we? He says, same place we were in last year. <laughs> so you can imagine how we learn our lessons. Anger is the second most problem problematic thing. It takes even longer to get over anger than lust. Lust can be taken care of if there are sufficiently attractive experiences inside within our meditation. That helps a lot. Because merely a, 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 a attachment to something new from detachment. So when we get find similar or greater pleasures inside, lust gets controlled. It does not get controlled without that experience. Anger is more difficult, but in a way, it's, just, it's something that comes natural to you when you begin to see the reality of people that they are part of you. It's very difficult to become angry at anybody if you know you're getting angry at yourself by getting angry at somebody else. 
these awarenesses, they can reduce anger, but anger scatters our attention. Lust draws our attention down, anger scatters it. Therefore, it becomes more difficult to gather the attention back to the third eye center. The next after anger is attachments. Attachment to family, attachment to children, attachment to parents, attachment to friends, attachment to cars, houses, refrigerators, attachment to objects. These attachments, and especially attachments to people who we think are close, big distraction. We are worried child is not well. Meditating, child is not well. How can you think of meditation if the child is not well? You are so attached. So these attachments that we have are also a big distraction. And sometimes they go later than even lust and anger. And that is why a big distraction that don't allow us to go within, don't allow us even to experience the true love that flows from a perfect living master. Next is greed. We are all greedy. Greed comes so natural that we say we are not greedy, but if something is given to us, offered to us, very hard, that it's a temptation that we yield to depending upon the price. Somebody wants to offer you more, you take it, less, no. There was a um, young boy in, in the United States who was born out of one of the slaves. His ancestry showed that his father, grandfather, great-grandfather was given a huge bit of land in a treaty, treaty done by the settlers in the United States. Little boy did not know his heritage, but people were trying to establish whose land it is. It did not belong to government, it had been given away in the treaty. And it did not belong to anybody, but because there was nobody claiming, a number of people had built their houses upon it and became a good rich colony. One man found out that this is this is something that belongs to whoever is the correct successor of that line. So they found him. Poor fellow was doing distribution of newspapers for pennies. He was actually the owner of several billion dollars worth of estate. So these clever people went to him and they said, we'll give you a few hundred dollars if you sign certain documents and transfer these to me. He said, no, 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 but he thought it's a big thing. Make it a little more. When they tried to give offer, one of the residents there came to the boy and said, this is worth so much. The boy raised his price. He said, no, I will not give you. Kept on raising his price. Eventually, he became one of the richest guys there. But the price was what affected him. In India, somebody found that the real successor has been lost of an estate like that. And they tried to find a man, a little boy, whose name was, surname was the same. They tried to make him appear in court and say, I am the successor. So they offered him a few pennies to just appear in court. He says, you want I'll tell lies? For your little money I will tell lies? At least double it. That's the kind of greed is inbuilt into us. That the price is sufficient, we yield to greed. So greed also is a distraction and does not allow us to go. But biggest obstruction, much bigger and last to go, is ego. I-ness. I know that. I can do it. I know better than you. This I, I, I. It is the face of the mind. The mind thinks 
but when it wants to express itself, it comes in the form of I. Now, I, when you say I, it's a big divider. I immediately creates I and you. Nothing divides us more than the ego or I-ness. Now, I'm mentioning these distractions, these four major distractions that create very much of an obstacle on the way. These are built into the mind. All these operate in the mind. So that is why sometimes we call the mind a negative power. And mind tries to obstruct this because of these reasons that we have. So in order to be pulled by love, these have to go. And these do not exist beyond the mind. They exist only up to the causal level of the mind. That is why they have to be cleared up before we can ever have the experience of being pulled by a perfect living master's love, pure love, to go beyond the mind. This purification process takes place slowly. Some people say, if I'm a seeker, why can't I just go right now to my place? What about these five? Sometimes they are referred to as five children of the mind. The mind is the parent and creates these children. So what about these five children? I did tell you the story of a man who claimed to be very enlightened. And I poked him with a needle. Then he ran. That's what I told him. What about your five children? Including anger and ego. <coughs> When you say it takes time to go within, to our own true home, to our own self, should be instant. It is an instant. When we go, it's an instant. Why we take time? To overcome the five children of the mind. And that is why we need patience on this game. Patience is needed because of these distractions, the negative obstacles that come. And when we have to go in the same life in which you are initiated by a master and not wait for another, slightly more obstacles seem to appear. If everything is predetermined, including pain and suffering and pleasure and happiness, does it make any difference if you are initiated and a meditator? Do you have the same experiences according to predestined destiny? Or does it make a difference? The destiny operates on the basis of our attention being totally captured, where we are playing out our destiny. Right now we are playing out our destiny in a physical plane. If you are only in physical consciousness, Using the physical aspect of mind, destiny plays full part, and these distractions are at height. But if you are at a different level and regularly visit the next higher level, which makes this a reflection of that, destiny here plays the same part what can be seen by people, but your attitude changes and you know the reality, so they don't affect you so much. If you are in the causal region, Destiny still plays its part. Everybody says you are going through the same thing, except that the five children seem to be less dominant. But if you cross the mind and live in a state of love as a soul and with awareness that that is what the truth is, the five children seem to disappear and they don't affect you at all. If you want to see a perfect living master, in addition to the fact he never claims to be a master, in addition to his humility in that way, in addition to the fact he never charges for anything and works for his own living, you will find that these five distractions are missing in him. That's a very big thing. We are all subject to it. And we can't know this just by a casual meeting with a man like that. You have to know, meet him regularly, know him, and spend time with him, and you find, why does he not get angry? Why is he not lustful? 
Why is he not greedy? Why is he not doing this thing? Why is he trying to hide his eye at all? What's gone wrong? No, it's gone right. And all of us can have that with an experience of just having one visit beyond the mind. It's a very big thing. So that is why when the whole system here is divided into negative and positive, the negative energy that is created only in an area where time exists. If time is not there, none of these exist. They are all expressions, expressions of the mind, which only operates in time and space. So that is why it's very important to know that it is only when you are beyond the mind that your true spiritual self is revealed to you. If you meditate to go to heaven, it can be done with the mind. Mind is happy to do that. If you want to do exercises of yoga, very easy. You want to put your attention on your heart, you can do it without problem. Try to put your attention on the third eye center, very difficult. The mind likes this, hates this. The mind, because of its very nature, the way it's built. That is why these are some of the questions people don't ask. And they just sit and wait, things will happen. And things don't happen. And that is why great master was so good to me. He said, talk to me. Every time you find an obstacle, I'll tell you what to do about it. He said, this is only necessary till you can talk to me internally. And that's the best part. The best part of this man's teaching is he does not say you have to come to me personally. <clears throat> you can develop excellent faculty of telepathy and telepathically communicate with me by manifesting my form which exists inside you in full at the time of initiation. You don't have to send a message to me outside, inside. <coughs> this telepathic communication with a master becomes very easy if you're able to see him inside. Seeing him inside is only one step. You don't have to go to the top of the mind for that. Just the very first step, when you go into the astral self, unaware of the body, you see him. Very big benefit. You can talk to him, and he gives you means to check if you are talking to the master with seeing him inside, or it's an image made up by the mind. We're talking to our own mind. He gives us a device by which we check and we can be certain it's the, mind. it's the master, not the mind. That's part of the process of initiation, explanation of how to work it out. Wonderful. When that happens, all the guidance can be obtained from him inside. And he is with you always. One of the things that affect most of us almost all of us, is a feeling of loneliness. We feel alone. Even in a crowd we feel alone. Even with a partner we feel alone. We feel nobody fully understands us. Because our relationships are with the body, a skin deep relationship. If somebody can understand our mind, that's a big exception to the rule. Nobody understands our soul and its seeking. And that is why this loneliness has affected us. And we can't even talk about it. Who should we talk about? Who, with whom shall we talk? They think we are happy. And we are always pretending to be happy. Just because culturally we are told to be happy when we are unhappy inside. Loneliness is a very big it's like a curse upon us, upon human beings. But if you have the manifestation of the master inside you, 
at least loneliness disappears forever. This is wonderful. You always have a friend with you, 24-7. There's nothing like that. It's not somebody you made up. It's somebody who you saw outside first, inside next, made sure what the conversation inside is with the same one you saw outside. Beautiful arrangement. That is why loneliness disappears. If you cross the mind also, something else disappears. It's called doubt. Because doubt is created by the mind. After that, you never have doubt. When you know, when you know, you don't have doubt. Doubt comes and you don't know. And also fear. Generally, fear is created after doubt. Doubt leads to fear. And fear disappears completely. Can you imagine living a life of fear with all our destiny intact and having no fear and no doubt? That is why you become totally certain about what you know, certain about what's happening, actually having seen it, not by speculation, and totally fearless. That's what happens. Now, that, these two things change our life right here. Let's forget about what happened through home or anywhere. If something can be done, as simply as following instructions in meditation and being pulled by the love of a person because we are ready inside and doubt and fear disappear, the whole life changes. Most of the time we are worried with doubts and fears. It's a function of the mind. I'm not saying doubt is bad. In fact, I'll say doubt is good. If there was no doubt, no skepticism, Anybody could say anything and we'd be so vulnerable to any, any advice. Doubt is good in order to investigate, in order to be certain. You have to have a certain level of experience and certainty before you will take the next step. That is why doubt serves a good purpose on the spiritual path. But if it goes beyond a point, it becomes an obstacle. If you're using doubt to screen, I want to clear my doubt. I don't want to take next step unless I have cleared of my doubt. Now, why is this? This man's teaching, great master's teaching, does not allow any blind faith at all. He says, do not believe anything unless you have experienced it. But that is, that's a contradiction in terms. Because if we have seen it, the question of believing doesn't arise. We have no it. Belief by itself is blind to start with. We are believing in something we haven't seen, so to some extent it's blind. But what his advice is that do you believe at a particular time in your life that you don't belong here? You have to believe that first. It's an experience, not somebody saying, you don't belong here, let's take you. He says, I belong, I, I love this place. It doesn't work. This first experience of seeking and saying, I don't belong, I want to go, is a proof of itself that the next step can be taken. It's not blind. Then the next step is not blind, because you had an experience. Okay, I'll try it out. And go to a master. Listen to him. He says some things. Should I believe it or not? I don't know. Hard to believe. But I had a question in my mind. And he was able to answer before I even spoke. How could he guess what was in my mind? Maybe there is something to take the next step. I drive my car and see a hoarding advertising some product. But a few words in that are exactly what I was thinking. How can such a coincidence happen? What does this coincidence mean? It means there is something going on. If the number of coincidences go on increasing outside, nothing inside. So there is something going on. 
these are all elements of belief based on experience, not the blind faith. When many of these happen, we know it is the master's doing. Okay, it never happened before. How come their number is increasing? How come this coincidence, which is supposed something happening against the law of probability? That's coincidence. It was it's probable and it has to happen is not a coincidence. But if I am saying to Master, I haven't seen you for a long time and I miss you, I don't know. Email comes that morning. How could it come at that time when I was thinking like that? These are external coincidences. And then if you're meditating, we get internal experiences. Both add up. We talk of intuition. Intuitive knowledge comes from the soul. Thought out knowledge comes from the mind. But is intuition only internal? Not at all. When you have an intuitive feeling or thought or knowledge, intuitive, gut feeling, and that's supported by something like a holding out right, opening a book and say the same word at the beginning. You didn't open the book to read that. How could those two match? You'll be surprised that when we are on this path, how often these two things match. An internal intuitive feeling and an external evidence of that being a part of the intuitive feeling. By coincidence. Coincidence is no accident. Somebody sent me last night a very interesting experience of a blind man who practiced Tai Chi. He was taught by a man, it's become a documentary. And that blind man, who's old now, has given a talk. There he says, the real secret of life I discovered was coincidence. Everything happened which was great in my life by coincidence. He says, I even begin to suspect, at the end he says, I even begin to suspect that coincidence is the creator of everything. That coincidence can be equated with the creator. A remarkable statement that I read last night. I know people realize coincidences are very important part of increasing our faith and belief. No blind faith. Believe what you experience. If it's good enough to take the next step, take one step. If experience justifies, take the next. Don't believe it, nor disbelieve. Our tendency is, I don't believe it, so it doesn't exist. Somebody says, I had a great experience. I don't believe it. If you could have it, I should have I don't have it. I don't believe you had it. That's not an appropriate way to react. If you don't have an experience, it does not mean nobody has it. Somebody says, you will get this experience. I can't believe it because I haven't had it, but I don't disbelieve I may one day. Remember, this is very important, that believe what you experience, but don't disbelieve just because you haven't experienced. Be open. Many of us are so closed. And what causes us to be so closed and not even open to possibility of things happening, possibility of other people having experiences, is mostly, I've studied it, at good university. I said it, the subject is good university. What causes it? Mostly religion causes it. Religious foundations are given to us when we're children growing up in our family where particular religion is being practiced. Religion binds us almost into a belief system based blindly on statements that have been made <coughs> in the scriptures. Blindly in what a priest is telling us. Religion does not say, don't have blind faith. Religion says, believe it. Why? Because we say it. Why? Book says it. So what happened? Our minds get so closed. 
we are afraid is a cause of fear if we get out of that frame maybe we are hurting ourselves hurting god so many people think like this religion has gripped us and yet religion was based upon spirituality religion talks of god religion talks of the truth and yet we can divide ourselves so much the more we divide the narrower the compartment in which religion has placed us there is one god christian say one god and there was a son jesus christ should believe in him if you believe you will be saved if you don't the rest of the world will go to hell they believe it genuinely i have talked to so many the muslim says allah in the name of allah all others are condemned hindu say these people have stayed away from true path every religion is confining us to itself not only to itself let's believe one god one jesus christ then why 16 denominations why protestants lutherans catholics all different are they different gods my friends won't go to a church that is not part of the denomination believing in the same god my muslim friends will not go to another muslim house both believing in the same allah the same muhammad no shia he soon what happened to us we have subdivided now what is the result of it all we grown up in this small compartment of belief systems totally blind I, I talk to people who have faith in their belief system over and over again, all over the world, and they are so caught up, they are afraid something will happen. We will be captured by the devil if we leave slightly this way. So these are blind beliefs so instilled in us that we are not open and. the spiritual path really required all path in every religion required you to be open christ never said that god is only made for christians there is only one god for everybody we are all children of the same god and what he said why don't his followers follow that prophet muhammad never said that there is two divisions he doesn't even say that rub or or god is only for muslims he didn't say rabb muslim mean in the quran he says rabb alamin of the whole world god of the whole world these founders of religion have said something else and the followers are doing something else why don't they read what the original founders said the founders have made it open Let's investigate and find and we can find and that is why it becomes a very big hurdle in many of us to get out of the trap of a confined way of thinking and i can't blame anybody this has been happening from our childhood upwards we grow with it religion is our parents religion and we grow with it 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 takes time to open up and say i must tell you seekers of the truth they are seeking from an early age we don't become seekers very late in life <coughs> seeking starts very early the discovery of the fact that we are seeking may come later and when we come later we were seekers we find we were seekers right from the beginning but we could not even express to ourselves that we are seekers because of religion the religious belief system we can't think outside maybe it's sin to do it so that is why it becomes difficult to open but at a certain point in life if you are a seeker of the truth you discover that you were in a trap and you have to be open 
to experience anything. And there is no scope in the true spiritual path for any blind faith of any kind. That is why experience and say, this is what I can see. I don't deny there may be more. I haven't seen. I'll take my time. And if it comes, I'll believe that also. Great master was very persistent in explaining this. No scope for blind faith in true spirituality. Experience it, believe it. One of the saints, Indian saints, in one of his poems says, do not even believe the word of your master if you haven't experienced it. Unless you see with your own eyes, do not believe even the word of your master. It's very strongly said. So that is why it's very important for us as true seekers that we want to seek the truth, not something that we are required to believe and we haven't even experienced or seen it. And this is part of the great teaching of great master. These are a few things that ultimately impressed me so much. I said I have to follow. One, an openness. If you don't like this, don't work. This system doesn't work for you. Get something better. Total openness. Secondly, don't have to believe anything unless you experience it, no matter how much you hear about it. This is wonderful. Now, all this looks good. All the stuff I'm talking is mental stuff. All mind stuff. Mind things like the way I'm talking to you. What happens when you fall in love? You forget all this. Everything is forgotten. When the pull of the master's love comes in that form, all these questions are forgotten by us. The mind is put aside. The love can be so powerful, it overrides the mind. On the sideways, somewhere mind keeps on thinking, are you sure, are you sure? Shut up. <laughs> At a stage comes when we ourselves tell the mind, I've seen what you're doing. I'm not going to let you interfere with the experience I'm having. Shut up. <laughs> and therefore, eventually, love always succeeds if it is that kind of pure love coming from the top, from the very place where it's created. That is why perfect living masters come here only for performing that part of the role, pull you from the mental regions to your true home. Great master said, my spiritual path starts from Parabrahm, beyond the mind, and ends in such kind of true home, totality. From discovery of the individual soul, where we discover we were just units of consciousness. The rest was all put around us to going to find that we were part of the same one and never left it as the true path. I am very happy I shared all these things with you because all of you are seekers. You wouldn't be here otherwise. And I know that you will think over what I said, maybe make use of it. Many of you are initiated by masters. Many of you have practiced. Many of you have gone way ahead of what I've talked. But still, I thought, if I can share from my experience, it be, might be useful for some of you. I have never in any of my talks used books to make my talk. I have never said anything to anybody if I have not experienced it. I'd be hypocrite if I do that. It, I, it's not my nature to say, tell, do this, but I haven't done it. Did I tell you the story of that lady whose child was eating too much candy and getting stuff on his face and all? And he, she knew there was a master, wonderful to children. And whatever he said, children would follow. The mother would say many times, you're eating too much candy. Please don't. Child would steal candy, steal where she was hiding it. So she took the child to that great holy man who had so much influence on children. And he said, Master, my child eats too much candy. Please tell him to stop it. It's not good for his health. Master looked at the child, said, bring him after one week. So she went back. After one week, she brought the child again. Said, Master, you said, come after a week. Here I am, just with my child. Master looked at the child and said, don't eat candy. 
child stopped eating candy. Very curious. Why he made us wait for a week? She went back to the master. Said, Master, first time I took to the child, you said wait for a week. And second time I came, you just told him. Why could you do it on the first day when I brought the child? He says, on that day when you first brought him, I was eating candy too. <laughs> I stopped eating candy for a week before I could tell him. <laughs> Nothing is more convincing to a person when he hears something from somebody who's talking from experience. And if people are just reading books and telling things, there are too many babies and perhaps it's in that talk. And that is why I said, I'm not going to share something from books. You can read them. In fact, I went to London recently and I asked, how many of you have seen me giving talks on YouTube? I believe there are over 300 talks. Almost everybody there they had. Here also? Wow. I said, how many of you have studied literature and books on, on the spiritual path? Everybody raised their hand. I said, I don't have to speak anymore now. <laughs> you already got all the learning. Learning is something very different from realizing. You can learn as much as you like. It doesn't mean you have realized it. Realization needs, needs actual experience. You don't realize anything without experience. So that is why I'm trying to finish this uh, program early because a number of people, long list given to me. I don't know where the list has gone somewhere. Okay. And I don't want to disappoint anybody. People have come from Norway, Estonia, Austria, different places. So I'd like to see each of them, though only for a short period, two, three minutes each. But I want to meet anybody because otherwise it uh, becomes uh, uh, people feel we came all the way. I missed this short personal meeting. Sometimes they only have one particular personal question to ask. They go away after all this long journey. I don't want, don't want to disappoint people like that. So that is why I'm ending the morning session early and seeing people even in the morning before lunch. And then after lunch, I'll come and see you at 3 o'clock for our final session. And if anybody is left over on this list, I'll see them after lunch. I am also told that they have prashad to distribute after lunch. Yes. After lunch, they are going to distribute prashad. What is prashad? Prashad is something blessed. It does not mean that it has to be only food, but very often we give it in the form of food. Great Master Prashad consisted of puffed rice, and he would give it his hand to everybody, he would hand it over to us. There were no bags, we couldn't afford, we were poor at that time, so we had to either open our shirt and take it, or carry some handkerchief to take it, and he'd give it his hand and we'd wrap it up and take it home. Puffed rice, sometimes he would put a little sweets in it, patashas, or sometimes other sweets also. Why well, I, rem I remember this. How do I remember? We used to stand in a line, in a queue, and I would watch if the next handful that is picked up contained that sweet or not. <laughs> if there was no sweet in it, I would let the next person pass ahead of me. <laughs> when I saw that, I was ahead of me. But prashad is just a blessed food. The blessing does not change it, molecular structure. The blessing does not make it into something else. Why well, I say this in India, I've seen, especially even in the United States. I found people keep prashad and use it as medicine. My child has fever, I gave him little prashad. No, you should give him some aspirin or Tylenol or something. You don't give prashad for curing fever. Yes, prashad will be good if it can remind you of your master. 
blessed food is only blessed so that you can remember who gave, when it gave, who blessed it. The prashad I want to give you is going to be very special. I will not only invoke the blessings of my master, the picture you see here, but I will pray to master whom you cannot see because he died in 1948. I have never missed seeing him till today. I will get him in his radiant form to bless the prashad. So it will be like great master's prashad. The, I cannot tell you how great my experience has been with great master's prashad. Of course, you have not seen him and you only see in his picture, but I will be so happy to give you something which I consider very precious. And I would request take a little bit every day. Every time you take it, you'll remember this event. If you don't take it, you forget after a while. Every time you take it, if you take little of it, then it lasts a long time. If it becomes short, and you have no time to go back to master like we used to have that puffed rice, but similar puffed rice was available in the market also. When it became little less, we'd buy some more. That's what he suggested, <laughs> not my idea. Master suggested, then put some more and shake it so you won't know which one is the original, which one is added on. So all of it will give you the same blessing and same feeling, so it will never end. There was a, there's an old disciple, a great master's time, very old, in Hawaii. And he wrote to me, he said, you are a great master's disciple, I have no prashad, can you send me great master's prashad? I wrote back to him, great master died in 1948. There's no prashad left of his. And he called me. He said, don't try to play games with me. I know great master stands alive next to you. You can get this prashad made. I got a big bag of prashad. Same puffed rice, same type. And got great master's blessing sent him. He was so happy, so happy to receive it. So they have prepared the prashad for the afternoon. I'll be very happy to come and distribute to you. Now because of the congregations, the audiences, they're becoming larger. So I've stopped giving them personally, one by one. So I, I get the blessing of Master, and then distributed by sevadars, people who are serving us. But I want to make an exception today and give you one by one. I'd be very happy to do that. So I'll see you about 3 o'clock again for that. Thank you very much.